Hello and welcome to the International Society for Physical Activity and Health podcast. Today's podcast is one in a series of nine podcasts on the eight investments that work for physical activity. The eight investments that work for physical activity are a call to action for everyone, everywhere, including professionals, academics, civil society and decision makers, to embed physical activity in national and sub-national policies. It's time to get into our podcast for today with your host, Matthew Tepe McLaughlin. Okay, today I'm here with Professor Jasper Schipperein, the President of the International Society for Physical Activity and Health. Hi, Jasper. Hi, Tepe. Thanks for having me. So could you start by just telling us, describing your this first investment, Active Travel? Yeah, um, Active Travel is basically an investment that deals with how to create cities um, where active travel is the natural choice. So how do you make it easy for people to use active travel as much as possible? Okay. And so how does making it easy, how does that boost levels of physical activity? Well, transportation or travel is part of everyday life. Every single one of us has to do it typically multiple times a day. So um, they're necessary activities. And if we can integrate moving more, being more active in our travel, in the things that we need to do anyway. It's a relatively easy way to increase physical activity without needing to go to the gym, without needing to enroll in an exercise program. Um, It's basically doing what you need to do anyway, but getting exercise in in the same time. So what are the kind of things that make it easier to become, to be active, an active traveler? Um, Well, one of the things that is that is quite crucial with travel is that you need to be able to travel to somewhere. So that basically means that when you think in terms of city planning, city planners need to think carefully about where do people actually travel to on a daily basis or on a frequent basis. So that means that you need to think about where are workplaces and schools, um, shopping, things like that. Where are they located? in relation to where people live. And um, if destinations, so these places to travel to are relatively close to where people live, it is a lot more feasible to use active travel. So that's that's a key ingredient for sure. Um, and then obviously, it's not only the distance. Distance is, is a key factor, but it's also, um, are there good facilities for active travel. So is there a separated bike lane? Is there a good sidewalk that people can use? Um, once, if you're using the sidewalk, once you get to an intersection, uh, is it easy to cross or do you, do you need to wait for many, many, many turns of cars using the intersection before it's the turns of pedestrians? Things like that, very simple things. It needs to be easy to choose walking or cycling. So, so you mentioned city planners there. Is, is, is there other people that this investment's most relevant for? Um, so I, I think this is one of those investments. Uh, there are more between these eight, but this is one of those investments where I think most of the things that can be done are actually outside the realm of typical health promotion or public health. So uh, I think in this case, a lot of these decisions need to be taken at a relatively high political level, where I think the most important players in this field are daring politicians that dare to say, yes, I know that removing parking spaces will be unpopular in the short run, but I know and I trust it will make a difference in the longer run. Um, And I think that's also looking in the past at cities that are nowadays seen as examples for active travel with a very high share of active travel, um, like Amsterdam, like Copenhagen, they've not always been like that. If you, and, and which is something that people tend to forget. So if you look at pictures from Amsterdam from the seventies, they were very, very similar to many American or Australian cities nowadays. They were not that different. It took bold political decisions 40 years ago 
to reach what we have reached today. And, and I think modern or now examples, um, you see, for example, in Paris, where there are huge differences simply because they have a mayor uh, that is very pro-active travel and has said, we need to make this happen. Paris is not going to function in 10 years if we don't make a drastic change. And they did. Yeah, it's it's great to see what's going on in Paris and uh, there are yeah it's, there's a lot of other examples since the covid-19 pandemic has hit as well exactly and, and and that's i think i mean i guess there is no disaster that doesn't also bring some good things with it and i think seeing these changes in active travel partly as a result of of the covid pandemic i think is one of the positive things that hopefully we can capitalize on that people realize it's not that difficult actually to make separated bike lanes you can do it hopefully a lot of the temporary versions that we've seen pop up in many cities around the world hopefully they can stay permanent because people discover they like them yeah it'd be that will be interesting to see whether some of those temporary investments end up end up lasting it seems that you know a number of countries have piled in a lot of money um into active travel almost on the back of covid19 as well with Ireland investing in a five-year plan. Um, the UK also putting a load of money in. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that all pans out and see whether we can create some more Amsterdams and Copenhagens. Exactly. So um, the next question on my list is kind of some of the evidence that was discussed. And well, obviously some of the evidence was that more practical evidence of what has happened in cities. Um, but what other evidence was discussed for this investment? Um, so in, in 2016, the, um, the Lancet had a, a series on the link between urban design, transport and health, where there was a whole series of, of papers where exactly these type of evidence compilations were, were created. And uh, there they identified sort of eight investments or eight interventions that together encouraged wild walking, cycling, and public transport. And there, the things they could find evidence for that it worked was uh, the destination, destination accessibility we talked about, um, but also yeah, where jobs are, so equitable distribution of employment, uh, managing demand of parking, so increasing parking mm. prices and I was reducing wondering... the number. I was wondering how long it would take um, for for a car to creep into the active travel discussion. Yeah. And it does. Um, I mean, there are also studies, a study from, um, from one of the Dutch larger cities where they looked at uh, why in, in two very, very similar neighborhoods. In one neighborhood, people went by bicycle to the supermarket. In the other, they went by car. And they just could not figure out what the difference was until they looked at the number of parking spaces in the neighborhoods, where in, this, in the neighborhood where parking was scarce, once people got home from their job, they didn't want to lose their parking spot. So therefore they cycled to the supermarket. Mm -hmm. So discouraging, uh, discouraging parking, making it difficult, especially for those shorter trips, uh, that is really a big factor. Mm, that, so that's, that's something right. that with, with Paris, I think that's they, they were saying that they'd removed 70, 70 odd percent of their on street parking to, to make way for the active travel. Exactly. But it's also if you again look at a at a city planning perspective, think about how much space we use in cities for parking and what that space actually could be used for instead and what the value of that alternative use would be. Um, parking spaces are, are really, um, from an economic point of view, a very, very dumb investment in cities. Mm, mm, for sure. So this is part of the Lancet series. Oh, yes, yes, part of the so, so it's, yeah, so the um, destinations, works, uh, reduced availability of parking. And then, yeah, the, the networks of walking and cycling trails is important. Um, but also thinking about residential density, because a... Uh, a neighborhood with a very low density, um, it, it simply doesn't work to have shops or workplaces or good public transport there. So too low density doesn't really work, but too high also causes other 
problems. So finding the right residential density that is also attractive for people to live in, that's probably one of the mm. big challenges, to be honest, how to do that in the future. Um, Densi- densifying suburbia. Densifying suburbia without people um, sort of getting very upset, without making the, the things that are good with suburbia, without removing those, but by adding more things in. I think that really is one of the, the areas where we need more research to figure out how do we do that in practice? What type mm. of densification works for whom, where? Um, I think that's one of the interesting research areas. Um, but yeah, reducing distance to public transport, um, but also making it attractive. So making, for example, sure that nowadays, if your transport system with buses and trains, if there's no free Wi-Fi, people get upset, um, things like that. So making sure that it's an attractive choice. Yeah, that's an interesting one. I hadn't thought about that. It just shows that there are so many little details to make things attractive to go by bike or, or walk or roll that it, it really does make a difference exactly and and what all studies show where you ask people why they've chosen either public transport or um, an active form of transport the answer very very rarely has anything to do with health it is almost always because it's the easiest because it's the fastest because it's the cheapest so that's why people choose it so that's, again, getting back to where we started. We need to make it the easy, obvious choice. Mm, interesting. All right, so we're coming to the close. Um, so in my final question then, so what are your, the key recommendations for policy, for practice, and for research from this investment? Large question. Large question. Um, so I think, first of all, this is a, an issue that is, is, as I said, it's very much outside the public health or the health research realm. So we need to collaborate with other researchers and other fields, and we need very much to figure out how to do some of these things. I think we know that if we get them done, they'll have an effect on public health, but how do we do them? So how do we work together with these other um fields how do we work together across city departments and make these things happen how do we convince or work with a traffic engineer to convince him or her that active transportation is a good idea Mm -hmm. i think those are some of the questions we we need to be looking at and also some of the the advocacy areas to talk about well it requires a bold statement it requires a bold political choice how do we make that happen? How do we find those politicians that dare to make that statement? How do we back them up? Yeah. I think those are the, well, the key questions for the future. It was pleasing. We've just had the Australian walking and cycling conference here in Australia. And it, that's exactly it. We were bringing together all sorts of different folk from different, um, different settings, from transport, from health, from research, from practice, from government, from non-government. And, and I think that's what's important to bring, bring everybody together. Definitely. Yeah, I, I, I fully agree. And then f- from a research point of view, figuring out what type of process can you run to make people work together and listen to each other and see that they can achieve more together than each within their own sort of silo and department. I think that's our interesting question. So systematic or systemic questions, um, I guess, how to make it work as a system. Great. All right. We'll wrap it up there. Uh, I'll thank Jasper and you'll hear from Jasper again um, on the next investment. So thanks for that, Jasper. Thanks, Teppy. Well, that brings us to the end of today's podcast. But if you haven't done so already, I'll encourage you to subscribe to your favorite podcast channel, the International Society for Physical Activity and Health podcast is available on all of the leading podcast channels, including Apple, Spotify, Google. If you've got an idea for a podcast, you can send that through to info at ispar.org. Thank you very much for listening, and we hope you can join us on our podcast again soon.